For our scripture reading this morning, Proverbs chapter 14, verses 2 through 7. Our scripture reading this morning, Proverbs chapter 14, verses 2 through 7. Follow along as I read, keeping in mind this is the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 2. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Joel. Uh, to do a little bit of rearranging here, so um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going here in just a moment. Looking good there. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Thank you. Can you hold it that way the whole time? Okay. This is a, not the way I'm, I'm used to doing these kind of presentations, um, but Mac. I love, I love Mac um, versus um, PCs, but Mac won't let you import your um, pictures from your, uh, from your camera into a PowerPoint presentation. I mean, all the rest of the stuff, they get really well and they goof this up. I don't, I don't understand how it works, but that's, uh, that's the way that happens. So we'll be, we'll be all right. We'll, we'll do it the, uh, sort, of, sort of the old-fashioned way. Um, Many of you know the story of uh, how, we, um, how I wound up getting to South Africa, um, the sort of miraculous week off of vacation that I got from work. Actually, not sort of miraculous, uh, da downright miraculous, actually. And um, I, I, I first decided that I did not want to go uh, to South Africa. Um, many of you know my feelings towards, uh, <laughs> as a general rule, towards um, summer missions trips. And... Uh, I, I think I got some clarification on that as well, um, which, I'll, which I'll talk about at the time. But um, ultimately, um, uh, it turns out that I um, went to South Africa, as you know. I just want to thank you all for your prayers. Um, according to Charles, who was, who was with me, he said, this is by far the best, the best um, time anybody ever came across, the, the least problems. We almost had no problems whatsoever. One time with a police officer, we did. Um, but that wasn't really all that bad. It was really a, a, an excellent time. So um, with that, uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. I'm going to have an awful lot of uh, things to say preaching-wise. There will be um, multiple, multiple mini-sermons uh, spread throughout the presentation. I know that that just makes your day. This is not one sermon. There's multiple mini-sermons that you're about to receive. Um, at, at the end um, of our... You know, service here this morning, we normally have um, uh, question time, but if you have a question that something's not clear while we're, while we're doing this, excuse me, please feel free to interrupt me, and we'll just uh, go ahead and do that. Well, 
Um, let's see here. Let's, yeah, there we go. All right. Let's see if we can get this larger here. So this is the way it's going to be. Hopefully you all can see that pretty well. Um, on the uh, morning of October the 26th, um, it was actually getting a little cool. Uh, Dave Stolzers came by, picked me up, and we took off for JFK Airport in, um, in New York, of course. And this is when the, uh, we, we actually made pretty good time, but this is when the traffic started to uh, mess with us a little bit. Uh, crossing what I believe is the Hudson River there and moving on to uh, JFK Airport. If you can almost see that on the right-hand side, perhaps it's hard to see. Uh, JF Kennedy Airport sign there on the right. Interestingly enough, it's the uh, Fun Vake Expressway, which is um, the name of the uh, missionary, of course, that I, that I, that I went to see. Um, one of the things I wanted to do while I was on my trip is uh, finish a book and uh, I just started this book by Pierre V. Ray, The Christian and the Magistrate. Anybody here ever get a chance to read this book? It, it yeah, it, it is, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, he deals with questions like, uh, what about war? Um, and and what, the interesting thing about the book is, and I'm almost finished, I didn't quite finish it, but the idea that the uh, law just applies to Old Testament Israel is completely foreign in uh, V. Ray's writings. He's a man who loved Christ, loved his law, Suffered a lot for it, and I highly, I highly, rec highly recommend the book. Um, I think I wore out my um, highlighter as I was as I was studying this, but I, I got a chance to read this on the plane and so forth. There I am, uh, showing up in Cape Town and meeting with uh, Charles. There on the outside of Cape Town, you can see it's a you know a, a cosmopolitan airport look. Anyway, um, while I was there, I definitely ministered in first world and third world situations. Um, South Africa is still, in many ways, at least in the Cape Town area. Um, for very first world malls. Uh, you'll see some of that as we, as we go. Um, I took a picture of my host. His name was Warren. I was not able to stay with Charles. Um, just really didn't have enough room in his house. But my host, his name is Warren. I'll, I'll show you his picture later. Um, this is a picture of the, his um, his door. Now, why uh, am I why am I doing this? You know what? I need to get a pointer here, and I think this is going to help me a little bit. I've got it. Yeah, I think I'm good here. You know what? Maybe it won't work if I don't plug it in. Maybe it will. There we go. Um, these th th these uh, bars here are the out actually the outside door, and this bar here is the inside door. Now, why do you think we have all these bars? Well, in, in South Africa, um, everybody lives behind a fence. Um, there are no houses in, in Cape Town without a fence. The, uh, the crime is, 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 is phenomenal there. Um, Charles told me uh, uh, he, he was staying about uh, seven or eight um, houses or minutes away from where we were. One night while I was there, he said that he, he heard a gunshot. He said he heard uh, people yelling. He said one of the things you just don't know as, as crime just becomes greater in South Africa one of the things you have to be careful of, especially if you're in the city, is you might drive right into a, a riot and not know it. There's nobody, there's nobody out there standing with a sign that says, riot, caution, riot. Um, and and uh, Cosmore, who, uh, I, I, that actually happened to him at one point. He, he got yanked out of his car, was accused of participating in a riot, and he just drove in. Um, South Africa, sadly enough, um, the country of South Africa was an extremely safe country. Um, in my generation, in the 60s, um, uh, I, I, I spoke to um, Charles' wife's sister, and she told me, she's in her 60s now, she told me that when they were young, in South Africa, they didn't, they didn't close their doors, the, outs the outside doors. And I said, you mean you didn't lock your doors to the outside? She said, no, we didn't close them. There was no reason to do that. There was just no crime. And now you have... Oh, you have two. Uh, you have two doors, and there's two locks here. There's one. You can't see the one on the outside, and uh, I mean it's a very, very big deal to be. You know, when you go in and out of a um, of a uh, door, make sure you lock that door. It's it's a big deal. Um, when when I was at Charles' house, you know he. he he closed his garage door. You know, you and I, we close our garage door. If we have an automatic garage door open, we close it. 
you know, we go in a house, it's going to close, no problem. Uh, there, you, you watch it. You, you, you make sure it closes. Um, someone could sneak in while you went in the house. Uh, another trick they do is they put a little brick underneath the, um, uh, uh, you know, w where it's trying to close. And so, it's, so it remains open, and then they can sneak in later when, when you're asleep. So um, this is the effect of uh, man's law, man's word, versus the word of God. We say here at Independence Reform Bible Church all the time that um, when we get away from God's law word, we always are making a choice for death, and uh, they have it in South Africa. This, this, is, this is more our future if we don't turn from our wicked ways, quite frankly. Okay. Table Mountain, just outside of, um, just outside of uh, Cape Town. It's massive. Um, we won't spend too much time on these, these type of pictures. And I, I took some pictures of zebra and so forth and, that I saw. Uh, a lot of these types of pictures we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on. You can look them up on, uh, you know, this is the age of the Internet now. You don't need the missionary from South Africa to show you all these touristy type pictures. Um, but they, I, was, I was just overwhelmed by the, 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 the size of these, of these rocks. Um, it's just beautiful. Beautiful country. You see the small houses there in the front and, and, and the comparison. Just, just massive. And there are, uh, even in South Africa, there are crazy people that like to uh, climb. If I get this, is a, get this is... Okay, good. Thank you, John. Um, there are crazy people that have to go climbing up the front of those. Um, not one of them. Uh, myself. That's uh, called Devil's Peak there. In South Africa, you see that there, there in, in Cape Town especially, there, are, there is building that's going on still. So it's kind of like a, a, a contrast, really. You have, this, um, you have this growing crime problem, and yet there's still lots of uh, money in South Africa. Uh, a lot of it is because... You still have people coming into the country from the other uh, countries uh, uh, around the area. And I just want to talk briefly about the, uh, uh, about the whole black, white, apartheid thing there. Um, in South Africa, um, they, have, they have these different divisions of races. They have the blacks and they have the co what they call the coloreds. The coloreds identify themselves as, as, as colored. And the two don't get along all that well. But there's still work in South Africa. There's still enough of a Christian heritage there that there's good things, there, there, there's work. Uh, but the problem is, um, oftentimes it's the people that come in from the outside, like from Zambia, uh, um, Congo, even, and they're the ones getting the work. But they, they, they you know, we talked to, talk to an Uber driver who will not mix at all with the, um, with the South African colors or blacks. Can you guess why that is? He will not mix with them. Can you guess? It's not because he doesn't like them. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 the ultimate reason is um, the black South Africans will kill black outsiders for taking their jobs. It's happened. And they, 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 they stay separate as much as they possibly can. It's, it's a crime capital of the world, um, and there's a lot of killing going on. While I was there, there were a couple more farmers killed, and they don't just kill the farmers. Um, they, don't, they don't just shoot them from a distance. They do horrible things like to, to them, like uh, in the one case, um, this happened a while ago, not while we were there. Um, they took a farmer, they uh, stuffed cow um, refuse down his throat until he choked. I mean, this is, this is, um, this is who these people are. This is who the um, United Nations and the United States turned South Africa over to. It's just true. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of guilt on the part of the United States of America, I tell you, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to what happened in South Africa. And Cheryl and I talked about that. Why, why the farmers? A couple things. First of all, the farmers, the farms there are very large, um, very expansive, and... Um, one of the things the communists have always been good at doing is um, hitting the, uh, the, the food supply because they know that hungry people will, will give in to a strong man a lot more quickly than people who are not hungry. And that's what's, uh, that's what's happening there in, in South Africa. They're trying to make the, the Western Cape ungovernable. 
And so that's, that's what we've got going on there. Um, okay, moving on. This is Charles and his family. The Charles there, Charles Van Veek. Uh, tough picture there. I uh, can't see a whole lot. Well, this is his wife, Sonia. Um, excellent host. And three of his four children there that are, that are uh, with him now. Um, this is his son, John Mark, and um, his son, Jason, who is here, and then his uh, youngest daughter there, Anya. Here I am um, getting fit for a microphone to uh, speak in uh, the uh, Durbanville Community Church. This is Pastor Mark here with his back to us. I'm sorry I did not get a, a, a picture of him, but this was my first speaking engagement. Um, the way it worked was we went, I, went, I left on Thursday um, and got there uh, Friday and then um, had a day to kind of adjust Saturday. And then my first speaking engagement was at this church. And um, you might not believe this, but yes, it is, it, it is possible. I am capable of speaking in a church situation with drum sets in the background. <laughs> this is not photoshopped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. And uh, my, uh, my, my, my title this morning, or my, my um, presentation that morning was from the book of Ephesians. Um, didn't preach through the whole, whole um, book, but um, just a minute of what we talked about. We talked about Paul's prayers for them which show up in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. And Paul has amazing things to say about the church. Amazing. And it's clear that without the church, you have nothing at all, of any good at all, <laughs> from, from Paul's first three chapters. Uh, six chapters in Ephesians. The first three, people generally say, are doctrine. The second uh, three chapters, people generally say, are practice. You can't really separate the two entirely ever. But it's a general uh, separation. And what I did then was we went to Ephesians 4 where the practical part starts. And the first thing Paul says is, now you, you people have got to learn how to put up with each other. You've got to learn how to bear with each other. Paul is, um, and I pointed out that Paul is not, uh, he's not some pie in the sky guy who says, oh, well now that we're all believers, we're, everything's going to be happy. We're all going to get along. It's wonderful. So after all these wonderful things he says in the first three chapters, the first thing he says in chapter 4 is, you've got to learn how to bear with each other. So that was, my, uh, that was my, my talk there this morning. I was uh, pretty much dressed up there uh, for that. They, they, don't, they don't do ties there at that, at that church. So I didn't, I didn't that day. A um, little bit smaller picture there. Um, this is where now we're, um, I, I, I wanted to show you the, the, um, the squatter camps. And, and you'll see more and more pictures here. But this is a, uh, uh, the beginning of, of, of um, what you'll see here. This is, uh, anybody guess what this is? And even, even here some more. This is a little bit better picture. That's actually not a house. Anybody want to give that a, a shot some more? Here we have on the left here, we have an old mattress going on here. Um, maybe I'll give you, you gotta, you're going to have to really use your imagination. Step into the third world for us here. That's why Cape Town is a study in contrast. You have the, 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 you know, the, the people with, with some wealth, and then you have the squatter camps. We'll talk more about them. This here might give you a little bit better idea this, um, they, they, they just park on the road. I mean, just, that's, that's what they do. You know, time to stop. Of course, it's not going to go anywhere anywhere. This is a, um, anybody, anybody give you one more shot? It's a, hard, it's a hardware store. It's a, it's a hardware store for, um, for a squatter camp. You can see they have some of their equipment here. They, they usually put their house together. If you want to buy a mattress, uh, you can buy one right there. And um, there you go. Now, um, what the West would say is, and even Christians would say, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, we'd say, oh, look at those poor people living like that. We need to send them money. We're going to talk about what happens to the money that gets sent. Because they don't have to live this way. This is a choice. We'll talk more about that. There's another, there's another store we go buy groceries and whatnot. You, know, you better have cash, apparently, to buy it there, to, to go there, but there you are. And you can see in the background there, it's just, it's just slapped together houses, uh, which would not pass most building codes here in the U.S. There are some of our fences there. I want to get a picture of the fences. 
Um, this, is, um, this is one of the more, uh, shall we say, uh, um, shabby fences, if you will. Most of the fences are concrete. Many of them have um, uh, wire, electric wire going, going around the top of them as well. It's a serious thing. The crime is very, very serious there. Um, I did get away with a, with a joke when I talked to uh, Frontline Fellowship. I said, you know, I said one of the things, well, two of the things here, I, I've, I've come to South Africa, and uh, I said when I got here, I, I called it South Africa. But now that I've been here for a short amount of time, it's obviously South Africa. And I said that's the first thing. But the other thing is, is that I used to think that, um, you know, when I know a little bit about construction, not much, but I used to think that when it's time to build a, build a house, um, you start with a foundation. But since I've been to South Africa, clearly um, when it's time to build a house, you start with a fence. They will do nothing without a fence. And um, you can see that when, they, when they're beginning to build, like I, we saw an area where they're building some apartments, fence was up and running. They were just beginning because what happens is the uh, equipment, any kind of equipment, any kind of uh, material immediately gets, immediately gets stolen and sold. Um, that's the way it is. So there you have, there you have one of your fences. After I spoke at the, the Durbanville Community Church, I uh, went to a uh, uh, church in, in, in the Kyalicha area. This is in a township. A lot of folks are poor, but it seems to be a, a somewhat of a somewhat of a thriving church. And the uh, you can see there's another photo there. I'm up there with a young man named Sipu. Uh, Sipu uh, functioned as a uh, translator for me, as I, as I spoke there that morning, that morning with them. So I, I got a chance to speak twice there on that, on that Sunday morning. And you could see the group that I uh, spoke to as well. Um, Sipu has a Christian school going on there, uh, which uh, Charles uh, supports. One of the challenges that uh, Charles faces there with the folks is, is teaching. Um, the Africans, um, just as a general rule, do not have a, a reading history or a reading mentality. So how do you, how do you teach someone who, who won't read or who doesn't read? Uh, Sipu is a very skilled administrator. He um, actually rents, his, uh, rents out some of the this facility. He rents that out and supports the church that way. But it's the challenge of, um, of teaching, teaching the law word of God. Um, it's impossible for us to read, for example, Psalm 119 without seeing the great benefit of knowing and believing the law word of God. We see that throughout Psalm 119. We see it throughout the entire Bible. So that's, that's a challenge there. Sipu has made uh, progress. There's much more progress that, uh, there's much more that needs to, needs to go on there. And you can see there from the back, a lot of, uh, there they're singing, the, these types of, um, you know, I don't know how, how the culture works here all together, but a lot of singing, they do it kind of opposite of what we do. We do a lot of preaching, little singing. They do a whole lot of singing and very little preaching. More photos there, perhaps a little clearer there, of the, um, of the uh, squatter camps. How's that now? Yeah, yep, there you go. They have cell phones, they have televisions. Indeed, they do. More photos there of, of that, and um, that's, that's the way it is. A lot of these, you see these folks walking here, this is the interesting thing. They're walking along there, they're walking to a pickup point where they can take a taxi to work. Some of these folks here living in the squatter camps, because you're living for free, think about it. You, you, you're not paying rent, you're not paying mortgage. You have uh, running water outside and uh, Johnny on the spots um, as, as well. There are very few people, very few, but some will. Some will live in the squatter camps, they'll save up their money, and then they'll buy themselves a nice house. A few of them will do it. Many others, they'll just drink it. They work and they drink on the weekends and that's, that's how they live. Yes? State, yeah, uh, they're, they're squatting on, on, on private land. Uh, there's nothing can be done about that, but the state takes care of the Johnny on the spots and so forth. And there's our 
hardware store again. And there's some folks there. I, I want to show this picture. They're, they're waiting there at a, at a taxi spot. They'll be picked up. And those folks there will, will go to work. And there's our Johnny on the spot. So you see the squatter camp size there. You're going to have to, if you want to go to use the restroom facilities, you're going to have to walk if you uh, live like over here. It's in that, it's in that condition that uh, Charles is ministering. I want to show you this picture here. We have, do have some Western uh, um, all-in-one all -in photo. We've got um, all, the, all the hot spots to eat here. This is a picture of the um, shore there at Cape Town and Table Mountain there in the, uh, in the distance. Here we are going into, um, into Stone Hill, Clip, Clip Huell. Clip, I, I have a hard time saying it, but remember when Charles was here, he talked about the work there at Stone Hill. There we are um, going into it. Um, you can see the dirt roads, and you can just see how this kind of a, you know, I mean, it wasn't horrible, horrible when we were there because it wasn't raining, but you can imagine what it'll be like when the rain comes down. Just mud and uh, goo everywhere. Now this is, I want to talk about this for, for a minute. Um, the land that they, that they are working with um, uh, there at, at, uh, at Stonehill, we'll say it that way, there's a church there, and Sh Charles' ministry has, has, um, uh, has basically been given this, this land here, and that's, that's one of their um, containers there. But this church building here is, um, th th they had to sign a 99-year lease for the church to use it. Now, it's, a, it's a, supposed to be a Christian church, but this is just the struggles, one of the struggles they have there in South Africa. Um, this, um, this church here is a colored church. Okay, now the colors are not as black as the blacks. It's important to know these things. Very important. Now, you have a colored church right here, right on the site of the, um, of the township or of the, of the squatter camp. Great ministry opportunity, right? But there's a problem. Can you guess what it is? The, the, yeah, the people in the squatter camp aren't colored. They're black. So that's the end of that. And that's, that's what's happening there. They have nothing to do. They will not allow the blacks to use their facility at all. The coloreds. The coloreds. Now, the, the, well, there, there are people who live on the outside. Yeah, they're just your basic Christian church. No. Yeah, the church is just, yeah, the building, the building sits there. Yeah, we, we, we're not inside the building at all. Um, I can't remember what's in that one. I believe that's a classroom. I believe, because they, they, they do... Uh, they do, do do teaching in here as well. But you can see here, you know, you're, um, you, you know it, it's not like this view we have in the West, right, of uh, we're going to come in and we're going to minister to the people. They're going to love us and everything's going to be wonderful. No, you go in there and you minister and they'll steal from you and lie about you and cheat you and destroy your property. That's why you see that. No, it's, 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 it's just, they, they don't have a whole lot more to fear from the blacks than they do from their own people. So that's not it. It's just flat out uh, decades of, of, of antipathy towards each other. Okay. Now, this is, this is um, Charles' people on the ground there at, at Stone Hill. We have a Mobuti here on the left. Not the greatest picture. I apologize for that. And we have um, Tunki here in the middle. Now, let me tell you about Mobuti and Tunki. And we want to talk about this. This is a second little thing to think about here this morning. Um, I asked Charles very specifically that, that, that there are no women and very few men or boys in these townships or these squatter camps that haven't been horribly abused. Horribly abused. The light of the gospel changes that. Um, Tunky is a, a former gangster and um, really wicked, wicked guy, drunk, drunkard, a lot of, lot, of, lot of alcohol, some drugs going on there. 
Mobuti here is a man who uh, became a believer a short while ago. He is highly respected in his community. And it might be a little bit hard to believe, but this is what these, um, these guys are able to do there. They, they help Charles. There's his men on the ground there in that, in that uh, township, or in that uh, squatter camp, I should say. But both are highly respected, and here's, here's why. I asked Charles very specifically about, about women. Women in this um, situation have no protection at all. None. Zero. If they have a father, he's the only time they see him is he's out getting drunk and comes home only to beat him. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. What's happening here is between, I mean, they don't, they don't look all that mean, but between these two guys here, they have begun a little, shall we say, rehab program for the township. And the rehab program is different from what you might be used to. Um, their rehab program is, they get the, the, the first thing they do is they, they will go and spank children whose mother cannot handle them anymore. And they'll go and they'll, they'll proxy spank the children for the mom if requested. That's one thing they'll do. But they do a little more than that in the rehab program. They will go physically beat up people who have abused other people in that, um, others in that. And they will throw out of the township Anyone who abuses a, a, a woman, by, I'm talking about, talking about rape, that's what we're talking about here. They, these two will, they are, they are the, um, they are the God's law enforcers in this, uh, in this town, in this um, little uh, squatter camp. Now somebody's going to say, well that's, well that's, uh, that's vigilante justice. Well, it's justice. I mean, do you have to have a, like, I don't know, do you have to have a badge and a blue outfit and a gun? This, this is, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm frankly thrilled about it. And we asked M Mobuti about it. He's a very articulate young man. He's taking care of his brother. He, he's, he's, he's actually caring for four other orphans at the same time. We asked him about it directly. We said, Mobuti, you know, what about, um, how do you do it? I mean, just, just an accusation? How does this, this work? And he was very quiet because Charles asked, they call him uncle, he, he calls Charles uncle. And uh, Charles said, how, does, how do you do this? Do you have, you know, just an accusation? And Mabuti got very quiet and he said, he was very quiet, he says, we, we do not throw anyone out without proof, uncle. So it's clear that between these two guys, they, they look into things and they dispense justice and it's had a good effect on that very, very difficult community. Everybody get what's happening here? You're, you're looking at the enforcers of God's law in a godless township. It's having a good effect. Ah, oh, should have shown that picture. A lot better picture, right? Uh, Mobuti is in his... Um, Late 20s, uh, Tunky is about 35. Now, Tunky, let me go back to him for a minute. Here's what he's doing. Okay, he doesn't, he, he's not working, but he has, a, he has a nice house outside of the township that he rents out, and that's his income. And he chooses instead to live in the township. That's how, that's how he's doing it. Yes? Colored or black? Um, colored and black. Uh, I, I, actually, Charles told me he didn't know how it works. He told me people are really scared of those two guys. And I don't know if they know martial arts or what they know. But they are veterans of fights, knife fights, all, all, all kinds of... No, they do not. Yes. Well, they, they, they don't, they would get in trouble for that if it, were, if it was known, if it was known. So they're doing, they're doing what they can. This uh, man here is a Charles' brother-in-law. He's a doctor. 
and he works, he, he was with us there that night when we ministered at Stonehill. Here I am with a um, ministering at Stonehill, speaking there. Um, this young lady here, um, let's see if I have a better picture of her. There we are. This is her reading uh, in, in their language from the Bible with um, Mobuti there um, with, with his light so she can read. Uh, a young lady, very, very bright. Um, um, uh, her, I, I can't ever pronounce her name, but uh, the best I could do is Los Cus. And they got a big kick out of that because that, that means loose cupboard. And um, they kept, after I was finished, they kept on laughing about the way I had pronounced her name. I cannot pronounce it correctly. But you just kind of loose, then they get a good laugh out of it. But anyway, she did a, she did a fantastic job, a, a very bright young lady. She's a teacher. And um, I, I have no, you know, it's, it's just difficult to look at these young girls in these townships because it's, they've been through a lot. You know they've been through an awful lot uh, there. And that's, that's the group when we ended there. Now, when we started speaking, um, there were a, a whole lot less. But these are the challenges that they, that they face there because um, the people come in late in Africa. It's not like the U.S. where everybody's on time all the time. It's, it, it, it's, it's not like that. Um, uh, the joke is in Africa that uh, God gave the Africans time but he gave the Europeans watches. And of course, the, the, the meaning is they, they do not understand like, like speed working faster, you can get more done. Um, watches, they, they just, they, they, they just, they're, just not, they're just not part of that. So there we are, there's more of them there. They am from the back watching uh, and, and singing. Um, I thought I had more, more photos there. I think I have, uh, uh, later I think we'll have a photo that I failed to um, put in the proper order. Here's one of the challenges that they face. This is just part of the hard work. What happens is they, they feed, when they go on Wednesday nights, they feed, they, they feed the people there. Um, when I was there, it was hot dogs. So you have an awful lot of people come at the end of the service. So one of the things they had to talk about was, should we, like, cut it off at a certain point? You know, if you're not in here by this time, um, no, no food for you. But how do you do that when people don't keep time themselves? I mean, how, how do you tell people, if you're not here by this time, well, they don't understand by this time. And so the way they're doing it is, if you're there, when the food's handed out, you get some food. They've talked about doing it differently, but they haven't been able to come up with anything better. It's just one of those challenges that you, that you face. Um, when you're in this, this kind of a situation. Uh, I took a picture of this truck. This right down here, you can't read it. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. Maybe I can do this. Uh, yeah, still can't read it. Um, it's, actually, it's actually a Christian comp statement there in the back of the uh, truck there. That's why I included that. Went up um, a hill called Signal Hill, just a really beautiful picture of Cape Town and the, um, and the um, ocean behind it. Um, here is uh, pretty interesting um, options for, uh, for food at a restaurant. Uh, you got some stews here. Ask what's cooking. Impala, kudu, buffalo, wildebeest. There's worse. Traditional stews, oxtail stew. Things are going south. How about crock, warthog, impala? Um, and warthog schnitzel. <laughs> Is that a question mark after enjoy? Uh, yeah, that's what that is. That's what it is. I think I already know the answer uh, to that one. But there you, there you go. No, I, I, I stayed far away from that. In fact, you know, we, we talked about that. Charles is, is um, you know, he, he's, he, he has some challenges when it comes to uh, digesting food food and so forth. Um, by the grace of God, I, I, I didn't. Um, it was, th things were fine. But um, we talked about the fact that maybe, you know, maybe I'd be a much more qualified missionary if I came back with malaria, right? If I came back with malaria, wouldn't I be a much, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, wouldn't that be better? We talked about the fact Charles like, you know what? I don't have to, I don't have to get sick to be a good missionary. Uh, I'm not going to get sick and there's certain things I'm not going to eat. <laughs> yeah. 
It's not as big in South Africa. It's very, it's, it's very rare. In uh, Zimbabwe, which is where this actually was, it's, it's a little bit more, but not so bad. I, I, got a, um, I got bit by one mosquito only one time. The whole, uh, whole time I was there, I slept underneath a mosquito net in, uh, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, but I did, while I was there, I killed two mosquitoes. So let no one say, I have not done good in this world. <laughs> have you gone to Africa and killed mosquitoes? I have. All right. Uh, this is my first picture of Cosmore. Not the greatest picture. There are better pictures of him. But there we are at Victoria Falls, one of the seven wonders of the world. If you know about Victoria Falls, it was discovered by David Livingston. Anybody know why the locals never discovered? I mean, think about this. This is, this is one of the things. It's, it's just one of the lessons. Why is it that David Livingston has to come all the way from England, or Scotland, if you will, to discover one of the seven wonders of the world, one of them, and the locals had never even discovered it. The people that live there had not discovered one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, why do you think that was? Some of you might know. Exactly. They would look at it from a distance, hear the sound, see the, um, and you really can't see too much. A little bit toward the right there, you can there just a little bit. But um, it wasn't, it, the, the water was really down while we were there. But you could see the, uh, you could see the vapor coming up. And the locals thought that that's where the gods lived. They were angry. That's where they were. And so the locals had never, ever even discovered one of the seven wonders of the world. Of course, David Livingston gets there and said, well, let's, let's uh, definitely go check it out, right? I mean, let's go see. Amazing. The superstition kept them away from one of, one, one of the great created spots in the, in the whole wide world. But that's the way it is. And we know that as believers. Just a couple of pictures there. Be the pictures don't do it justice. You can see the uh, mist rising there. Just beautiful. Beautiful. Um, I don't know if you can see these crazy people up here or not. But um, <laughs> that's on the Zambia side. Because the Zambezi River um, splits Zambia, uh, Zambia and uh, Zimbabwe. <laughs> uh, no, uh, none of the safety stuff features that we have here. And these cats are just out there, like, uh, checking things out. And they're really, really pretty close. Um, Charles did tell me that they do fish people every year out of, the, uh, out of the river that just get too close and fall in. Oh, there they are. A little bit closer. You see that. Experiencing the falls, you can see those folks up there. I, uh, I stayed far away. Okay, here we are now in, um, in, Zam in, in um, Zimbabwe at our parents' retreats. This young man here, this man here, his name is Washington. Um, I want to tell you about Washington for a little bit. Anybody follow uh, Charles, um, um, his... Uh, he has newsletter, and the young man who's got his, uh, got his uh, leg bit off by a crocodile. Okay, well, these are his parents right here. And this is, this is a, 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 there's a couple things going on here. Pumi, that's his name, M-P-U-M-M-A, Pumi. That's the young man who's got his leg bit off by a crocodile, believes that his mother has given up on him. You see, this is, this is a different culture here. Um, if something bad happens to you, the ancestors have done it, and you've done something to deserve the wrath of the ancestors. So why should mom and dad um, love you when the ancestors don't? You, 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 see, you see the logic here. Um, Washington, his father, I think, has made more progress than his, his wife has. But they're both devastated by it, and Pumi would not come home without his new leg. Um, he feels the rejection of his, of his own family very acutely. Um, I want to tell you something else about Washington. Everybody remember Cedric the Lion? Who, uh, Cedric the Lion was killed. Remember that? And this dentist who shot him was castigated and maligned, right? Well, Washington is a, uh, is a game tracker. He's retired now. Um, he told us something about Cedric the Lion. First of all, Everybody's like, oh, he went on the game preserve area and he shot the lion. Isn't that terrible? Well, um, not a lot of fences there. You can't tell. It's very difficult to tell where you are. Um, 
in that, in that game preserve. No fences, no signs. They have signs and fences when you come into the area where people are, but in the area where you travel, there's, there's just trails. It's hard to tell. But it turns out, I didn't know this, Washington told this to, to uh, Charles, that uh, Cedric the Lion has ki had killed four people that they knew about, two children and two adults. And who are we concerned about? It's maddening, quite frankly. It's no, no. And, and of course, what's happened as a result, it was a lot more, um, lot more activity there, but since, since the whole Cedric the Lion thing happened, um, the, Western, uh, uh, the Western tourist money has dried up rather, rather severely. But the social justice warriors are happy, so it's all good, right? I, I mean, I, I don't know a single so, social justice warrior who would have had a problem if Cedric the Lion would have killed 10 more people. I mean, I mean name me one social justice warrior that would have had a problem with that. Wicked, maddening people. Uh, when you're driving in uh, South Africa, you're going to run, or in Zimbabwe, you're going to run into certain objects if you don't slow down, and that's, this is definitely one of them. Here we are, um, there is a better picture of Cosmore um, at, the, uh, at the weekend retreat, and he's got, he's got an um, interpreter there with him. Um, I've, I've skipped ahead here a little bit, I'm sorry. This is the church where I spoke on my last, my last Sunday there. Again, a lot of singing went on. Here's a picture of all the stuff I brought along with me so that I could digest my food and hopefully not get sick. Oh, this is out of, oh boy, my, out of sequence here. Um, you see the bicycle there on the top. This is a, a very um, high class shack. Um, this is definitely the uh, cream of the crop um, shack there in the neighborhood. Going back here to Cliphevel, I, I, I got ahead of myself there a little bit. This young lady here on, on a wheelchair, completely rejected. Again, you have these kind of uh, physical defects. You're just, it, it, it's, it's, you're just rejected. And people will turn their back on you, is, is what, they will, what they will do. She has a very, very difficult time. Um, Charles and others have reached out to her, as, as has um, Mobuti. This uh, man here is the man that I stayed with. His name is Warren, and this is his little son um, with him there as well. And um, Warren works also with Charles at, at Clippyville. At, at Stonehill, I should say. This is Charles' son working with a young boy there at uh, Stonehill whose bike is apparently broken down. He's trying to help him fix it there. And there is, uh, my picture's out of sequence. There I am back at, uh, actually went twice to, uh, to, to Stonehill. There's Charles. Um, he's got a good laugh out of that young lady, and he always tries to pay attention to her whenever, whenever he goes. Right here you can see the hot dogs being handed out. Um, Charles told me, he said, hey, he said, some of these, pe some of these kids are fine. Um, they're in, in it for the eats. He said, other kids, um, they're just hanging around the neighborhood. They may or may not have a mother or a father. They have a house to go to. Mom and dad may or may not be there. He said, some of those kids may, may um, not have eaten for the last uh, couple of th three, four days, may have had nothing to eat. Okay, there we are now heading up to uh, Zimbabwe. Oh, no, that's, that's before that. This is, um, I'll have to hustle through these. This is breakfast in, um, in Franchek. Franchek is a spot where um, the, French Huguenot, the French Huguenots, when they got kicked out of France after, um, after the Roman Catholics got a hold of things again there um, and broke the peace, many went to, many went to England, many went to, um, some, went, some even went to Scotland, a few. Actually, wound some went to Germany. A few actually wound up in South Africa, and uh, that's that's uh, Franchek. And so that's when you go to Franchek, um, there the, the village of Franchek. There's a lot of Huguenot uh, buildings and statements and, and and churches churches there as well. You can see that's uh, Mobuti there went with us, and that's Charles, and uh, I'm the guy in the white the white outfit there. That's uh, Peter Hammond speaking at Franchek. At, at um, this is the 500th anniversary of the, of the Reformation. And uh, there he is speaking, and there I am speaking as well. I actually did a, uh, I actually did a Mars presentation there as well. I'm going to skip ahead here. There's a lot, 
happening here. Um, I'm bringing greetings there from uh, the U.S. at a um, 500th anniversary uh, um, celebration. This lady here, it won't mean much to you, but it means a lot to me. You can't see her too well. She is the daughter of P.W. Bota, who was the last legitimate prime minister there in South Africa. He um, was a pretty good guy, a tough guy. We heard here he, was, um, he died of a stroke. I always questioned that, and she told me, no, he was actually poisoned. They uh, managed to poison his tea. And once he was out of the way, then South Africa was able to be turned over to the communists. Uh, more about that if you want to talk about that later. There I am with, um, with that young lady. Her name is, we, we would say Roseanne. They say Ro Roseanne, R-O-Z-A-N-N-E. P.W. Botha's daughter. Um, it was too da she, she has two brothers. They both had to leave South Africa. They felt it would be safe for her to stay. And so far, it's been safe for her, not for her husband, who has been attacked and shot, but he still uh, lives. There I am um, on a radio, radio show, um, radio program. This young man named John works with Peter Hammond um, in, uh, in, in, at, at Frontline Fellowship. Um, I want to hustle here to the end. I'm sorry. I've got too many going. This is me speaking to the, uh, um, to the young boys at Stone Hill. They call them the Soldiers for Christ. Uh, you see uh, Mobuti right here, and there's Tunki. The rest of these young guys here, um, some of them can read a little bit. One of these, one of these guy, young, young boys got drunk. We don't know which one it was. I don't know, but one of them did. Charles will have to deal with got drunk and beat up some girl, and they're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. It's, it's just what they deal with there in those, in those townships. I mean, everybody looks happy in, in there, right? You know, everybody looks good. Looks good. Um, but they get drunk, and horrible things happen. All right, um, there I am uh, with, with uh, ministering there to a Frontline Fellowship. There's uh, Peter Hammond there in their group. He, uh, it was worth it. He gave me some books for free. <laughs> there is um, Cosmore, and there's his wife, Liza. There we are in, um, at, at the game preserve at the, um, uh, at the, at the weekend retreat. Uh, there's a couple, couple of monkeys and a couple, couple more baby monkeys. You all know what this is. This is the Livingston Monument at Victoria Falls. Of course, I had to get that picture taken for sure. Uh, I want to I wanna wrap it up. Uh, this is our weekend retreat. It looks like the folks are there having a good time, and they were. It was an excellent time. Uh, just, just to let you know what Cosmore has to go through, um, The game preserve is run by the government. Cosmore and, they, and their phones don't work, and no one's fixing them. And that's the way it is in many places. There. If stuff doesn't work, it just no one fixes it. Light goes out, it just goes out. Cosmore had to drive two hours uh, one way, had to do it twice, so a total of eight hours he had to drive because these people would not pick up their phones. Um, working for the government, what do they care? Um, when we got there, uh, Cosmore to this to this place. Um, they told Cosmore he hadn't uh, he hadn't paid. He had come up the week before to make sure all of that was done, the paperwork, everything. He gets there. There's some new person there. We don't have any proof that you that, that you paid. Everything is. If you try to get something done there in Africa, especially when you got up further away, it's everything's a hassle. Everything's a problem, because when you're getting paid by the government anyway, why should you put up with someone who wants to stay with you? You're just a problem. And so that was, a, that was a big challenge that they faced. There's Cosmore um, um, speaking, and Ma uh, Mandla there is, is um, interpreting. I want to talk to you about Mandla for there for a second. And I want to talk to you about what happened with Cosmore. He looks like a young guy. He's actually in his 30s, recently married. Um, I want to talk to you about this, and, and then one other thing, and then we'll be finished this morning. Um, when Zimbabwe kicked out the white farmers... Um, many of them went to Zambia, and they're, they're thriving in Zambia, across, across the river. But what do you do with the old farms? Well, there was a white farmer who knew Cosmore, and knew Cosmore was a good guy, and uh, the, the, the farms now had to be owned by, by the blacks in, um, in, in Zimbabwe. I mean, do you get it? You know, you're, you're, you're white, you can't own the farm, you've got to give it to the, to the blacks. 
So one of them gave Cosmo a farm. Now this is the kind of thing I will tell you, my friends, that if you're not, I got, I got to tell you, if you're not post-millennial Calvinists, you, you'll, you'll, you'll just lose your head. Either that or you'll just check out. I want to tell you what happened with this farm. Cosmore, and it has to do with Manla there, Cosmore opened up an orphanage because there was all kinds of problems there in Zimbabwe. When, when the Zimbabweans got their independence from the white colonialists, there were 17 million people that lived there. Today there's 8 million. So in 20 years, they've lost that many people. They, it's, it's, it's a disaster and, and continuing. Cosmo opens up, a, opens up a, a, an orphanage. Sounds like a pretty good thing, right? Guess what happens next? He has a thriving orphanage. He's made, he's made improvements. It's a beautiful farm. Guess what happens next? Not even being black is good enough. The state saw the facility, because they don't want to work, right? They saw somebody else's work, and they took over, his, they took over the orphanage and threw the, or, threw the orphans right out on the street. It's what they did, right? Manla was one of the older orphans at the time. This is the work that Cosmo has done, okay? Now, we're not done yet, though. Here's what happens next. Of course, they take over the farm. Now, do you think they care about the farm? Do you think they're going to take good, you know, preserve anything at all? You, 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 what do you think is going to happen? They've ruined the farm, ruined it, broken down, broken windows, electricity broken down, a mess. Guess what happens next? So you can't, you can't think of it. You, you, you wouldn't think of it. I'll, I'll tell you what happens next. The state has now come back to Cosmore and said, you can have your property back if you want. See, aren't we good? Aren't we nice people to work with? <laughs> you know what Cosmore said? He said, fix it the way it was, and I'll take it back. Well, no, 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 you're ungrateful. But Cosmore's not stupid now. He knows that if he takes it back, he'll, he'll fix it again, and guess what's going to happen to it again? And that's exactly what they, what they want to happen. I mean, I, I'm telling you, it's, that, that can make you crazy. Um, if, if you don't believe in a just God who will settle accounts and whose kingdom will spread from shore to shore, I don't know what you can do except ch check out. In fact, my wife and I were having that, con that, that conversation. And, you know, she said, you know, that's been our experience. You know, people just, when you, when you tell a story like that, that just, if, if you have a soul at all, you, 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 you're, you're Blood is at the boiling point. It's just so much, so makes it so angry. Well, a lot of, you know, I mean, growing up, people would hear the kind of story and just check out and say, well, you know what? It's just going to get worse and worse until Jesus comes back. And that's, those are the only two choices. To either believe that there's going to be justice in time and in history or, oh, well, nothing we can do about it. One last thing and then we'll be, be done. For, for, for Cosmore? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he, he will not be able to do anything with it over the long haul. So what he's doing now, what Cosmore is doing now, is he is, um, he's bought some chickens, and he's uh, building some chicken coops, and he's trying to uh, build it up so that it can't build, build up a business that cannot be taken away from him so he can help people that way. Yeah, something totally different. It's their land. He knows if he does anything good with it, he'll get it back again. That's the way it is. Yeah, Wes. Okay, same, same question. Same question. Yeah. See, and this, this is why we have to have a comprehensive view of, of loving God and loving our neighbor. Because how, how do you love your neighbor while the state is still doing that kind of stuff to him? And I, yeah, talk more about that in a minute. Here, okay, this is, this is another maddening thing. Just drive you crazy. You, ever, you ever recognize this guy up here? It's Mugabe. I'm up in Zambia. He's about 93 years old. He's been the dictator of, of, of basically, single dictator of, of uh, Zimbabwe. He's the one that's presided over all these people leaving. Death everywhere. Disease, horrible. Um, murder of white farmers. Chase them out. 
okay? And I said to Shah, I said, what's, you see his picture all the time. It's like, it's like Soviet Russia. It's everywhere. And now, here's the ironic thing. Um, they had a thriving currency when this guy came to power. He's destroyed their currency, and the only currency worth anything at all in Zimbabwe is U.S. dollars. Okay? And I said to Shah, why is this picture all the time? He said, well, they have this picture up. Anytime, anytime money is exchanged, they have to have his picture looking over it. So wherever there's any kind of money exchange at all, you have, you, by law, you have to have a picture of Mugabe because he's like looking over you to, so you can enjoy his benevolence because it's because of him that you can have any money at all. Do you get the irony? The guy who destroyed the currency is the guy that you're supposed to pay homage to. It's maddening. Um, it's, uh, it's, this is the uh, building at the game reserve, reserve where I was doing the speaking. It's, it's, a, it's a little, like a conference room right there. A lot of AIDS, this man here is, uh, has AIDS, or excuse me, HIV positive. Zimbabwe, one out of three, pretty much HIV positive in uh, Zimbabwe. There's Washington again. Um, I just want to hustle through these. This is me ministering. This guy here, his name is Robson. He's a farmer. I called him the editor. He would sit in the front and help the uh, interpreters all the time. Knows eight languages. These people aren't stupid. The problem is they don't want to work. There's a church building there. There's, this is Pastor Solomon there, the church where I spoke the last time. Uh, I want to get this last picture here. Oh, by the way, you think we work hard to uh, set up in here? They have to carry the chairs to a whole different building. So think about that. Some of the kids there. There I am speaking um, there at the, um, in this case, it was at the church. Okay, this is, this is going to be my last photo. Um, uh, this was the high point of my, of my trip. You can't see real well. This is Charles. And, of course, uh, this, this man here, I, I, his name was very difficult to pronounce. He is the, he is the deputy head man. Pretty important guy in the area. Uh, last photo here this is. This is what I want to tell you about because I saw... I got an opportunity to see missions in action. This man, I was talking to Charles here, and said, Charles, we need, we're very poor, we need support from the West. Translation, we need money. We need money, we need training. Well, what would mo most missionaries do at this point? Hey, you know, I'll talk to our people. We know you need money. We'll get you some money. Charles had the tough mission work that he had to do right then and there, and he did it. It was very important for me to see this. This is the tough mission work that has to be done. Very few are willing to do it. He said to this deputy headman, he said, um, well, the problem is your people are lazy. He said, why should I ask people in the West who work hard for the money to give to you, to your people, who won't work? who will just waste it, they'll drink it, they'll, they'll steal, and they'll destroy everything. Why should I ask them to do that? You know any missionaries that talk to people like that? But it's actually true. And the man, this man agreed with Charles that they're lazy. And Charles said to him, he said, you know what? We're helping people with machines that grind up maize. He said, something amazing happened the other week. Someone's maize machine broke down, and unbelievably, they went and fixed it themselves. And he told, he told him, he said, you know what? You know what we usually get when we try to help people? We help them with a machine, and it breaks down. And you know what they do? They call us and say, hey, your machine broke down. You come and fix it. Charles went on to say, you can do things right now. You can raise money right now. You can build chicken coops. There's a, there, there's a, there's a chicken... Uh, industry right here. The Italians are opening up a coal mine very near that area. You have all kinds of opportunities to sell them food, and, and you're not doing it because you're lazy. So why should I give you all this money, get this money all for you, when you won't do what you can do right now in front of you? Serious mission work. This far away from my face, it was a beautiful thing to see, and extremely rare. One last thing. Charles wasn't, wasn't done. When I was speaking at one point, Charles, Charles said to me, he said, you know, said out loud, he said, uh, you know, one of the problems here, the men are lazy. They won't do any work. They have the women out there doing all the hard work, and they just sitting around on their rear ends. 
What's to be done about that? And it was, so, it, was, it was such a stiff message to the interpreter, it was a woman this time, did not want to interpret it. Now, most of the people understood enough English to know what Charles was saying, but she would not, did not want to interpret that. And I simply said, look, I mean, I'm just there. I'm just a guest guy. What am I going to say? I said, look, the first, the first job in the world was farming. And God gave that job to the man. He gave it to Adam. And he gave him Eve to help him get it done, not to do it for him. So you guys that aren't working are abandoning your responsibility. You've got to get to work. Whatever. I mean, what, what, what else am I going to say? But you know what? I, I had the example of, of, of Charles telling them the truth already. And uh, it was... <laughs> it probably wouldn't get us a whole lot of love. Oh, oh, one other thing, too. We talk about wife beating your wife. There's a topic. I had to address that. Um, we'll wrap it up with this. I keep saying I'll wrap it up with this, but I, wanna, I just want to say this. I talked about that, about how horrible that is. I said, why would, why would, you, go, why would you abuse your, your, your best counselor? I said, your wife is your best counselor. Why, why would you go beat her? What do you, what do you, what do you think you're doing? And I'm telling you, these guys, just in there, they're sitting there quiet. No one's saying I don't beat my wife. They're, they're, they're quiet. After I was finished speaking, um, Cosmore came back in and said, uh, says they, they want you to see this video of a man beating his wife. I said, all right. And so I saw it. I watched it. And they thought it was in Botswana. What it was, was, was they... Um, it was a man, he had this long, about a six foot, like a flexible stick. And he was just whacking on his wife. And she was crying and begging and pleading, begging and pleading for him to stop, but he wouldn't. And um, that went on for what seemed like a long time, probably a couple minutes. And it, was, it was horrible to watch. I said to Charles, Charles saw the same thing. I said, Charles, is this, is this typical? Is this worse? Is this better? Is this, is this no, what, what is this? And uh, he said, um, it's better and worse. He said it went longer than it usually does, but he's using a flexible stick which won't break any of her bones. Oftentimes, he'll use a hard stick which could break her bones or a fist which could break her bones. So that goes on for shorter, a shorter amount of time. But this is, this is, what, just, this is what, what goes on. They wanted me to see this, you know, the, 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 the folks that were there. They, they wanted me to know what, what happens. Because they're, they're trying to get that group there. No, no, no. To, to, to know that, that, that how horrible, what, what, it, what it really is like. Because what happened was, I told him, I said, um, <laughs> this was kind of funny. Um, I told him, I said, I, I've married 37 years. And I said, um, I've, I've never even, I went like this. I said, I've never even touched my wife, not even like that. Right? And they all looked at me in a little bit. It, got, it was a little bit of a funny look that they gave me, right? I said, no, of course. I said, you already know I have nine kids, so I've definitely touched my wife like nine kids kind of touched my wife. They all got a big big kick out of that. They, they knew what I was talking about. All right. Um, the last thing here. I, a lot of emotions coming back. A um, lot of lessons. The hard work of missions. Changing the way you think entirely is hard work. We're not doing here, Charles is not doing what some missiologists tell you to do, kind of like add Jesus to their culture. And that's going on in mission circles today, you know. Don't, don't, don't mess with their culture. They're not going to listen to you if you challenge their culture. And I, I, I while I was there, I mean, I, I, I found myself just getting angry because we have all kinds of people in the West saying, we don't care about the culture. Culture doesn't matter. They just need to believe in Jesus. Well, in the back of your bulletin today, as we wrap this up, we have this, uh, where's my bulletin? Yeah, what do I do with it? Thanks, John. How's, how's this for culture? From Titus. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. You see what Paul's saying there? 
their faith will not be strengthened as long as they're a bunch of lazy bums. That's exactly what he is saying here. I found myself just getting so angry that we have people here, supposedly people that know something, that want to say, ah, I don't care about the culture. Just get them to believe in Jesus. And Charles, thankfully, fortunately, is saying, you know what? I'm here to destroy their godless culture. I want to destroy every trace of their wicked culture and build them up with a godly culture. But yeah. Boy, I'm glad I came to Africa. This has been a good trip. All right. That was a lot longer than I wanted it to be, and I even skipped over a bunch. You can tell I'm not a veteran, like, missionary guy, if it's, especially if you read my blog, right? I, I mean, I did, I did not definitely use the uh, normal missionary uh, letter template for my blog. Thanks for reading that, whoever did. And thanks for your kind attention here. Are there any? Any? Yes. Average person there, can they speak more than one language and understand? So right. there, it's not a learning problem. It's no. just that they can't read. They were never able to access materials. Two, two problems with the reading. This is, this is typical Western UN stuff. I mean, you, you got to think about this for a minute. All the people don't know how to read, but no one's thinking about giving uh, about about some, something to read. It's it's, it's just a, a, a thing. Yeah. Um, first one: How can we help Charles? Um, do we need books. I mean, or... books books are a challenge. I gave a, a book to a Cosmore, and Charles said he's going to really follow up with him to to, to see that he, he reads it. Uh, I don't think that's, that would help him all that much at this, at this point. I think the way to support uh, Charles, what he's doing there, and, and Peter, is to support their, uh, support their, to, to, to support their day-to-day -day activities, meaning this. Um, Charles told me this. He said when he first started, he was excited about God's law, about God's kingdom, and wanted to spread that message, but was told early on that people give to projects. They don't, they don't just give to you. And um, I, th I think the biggest challenge for him is just the day-to-day -day living, which is a, 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 real, a real faith commitment. Um, he did get the money for the retreat. It cost a few thousand dollars to do that. He got it right there at the end. And then he told his other people already have the money because he, he had someone else who was going to help him with it. And so I, I, I believe he's being extremely honest about his projects. But it's very difficult for him to raise money um, for the day-to-day -day stuff. Now, I want to talk about that as, as, as a little bit too, because I, I, I've, I've questioned the whole money-raising thing, support thing, and I've come to the conclusion that if you find a person who is godly and good, they're worthy of your support. But you gotta find that out first, and you gotta stay with it. You, you can't just do the blank check thing for, for over years and years and years. You say you had another question? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, like, the folks that live there, how in tune are they with their history, their uh, Nelson Mandela apartheid, you know, how things used to be and who did what? Are they in tune uh, at all? Or? The ironic thing there is that the, the older whites are. Here's, the, the, there is, I think there's going to be another revolution in South Africa. Uh, Cheryl told me about a conversation he had with a black friend of his, a friend. Okay? Who said, hey, we, this second revolution is going to be the poor against the rich. It's not going to be racial. Right? We're going to get rid of these rich people. Farmers are rich. We've got to get rid of them. Right? And, and, Char and this is a guy that he knows. Okay? And Charles said, but in your mind, aren't all white people rich? They thought about it. I said, well, yeah, I guess, I guess yeah. I, I guess I, I do think that. So it's, it's going to be another, I believe another problem is going to happen there unless there, there, there's some kind of miraculous intervention that goes on there. But I think that's absolutely uh, going to happen. Um, the ir ironic thing is that the whites that are, that are left in South Africa are the ones that voted to give over power to the blacks. But they're white. They're still white. And they, 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 you can't have them. Anyone under 20 wasn't even alive when all this happened. But they're white. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're sitting here in the U.S., everything you see, 
we can see happening here. We can see the racial divides. We can see the rich versus the poor. We can see the the unrest that we have, the communism, the Marxism, the Antifa, and all these problems that we sit here and we say, "There's no, we're not that much different. We just have a have a different veneer on top of it." I mean, you've got 40 people sitting here. What do we do? What do we What do we do? We can't all move to Columbia or inner city Baltimore or inner city Philly because those slums, they just have a little bit nicer features than the slums in South Africa. What do, like, is there any wonder that people throw their hands in the air and say, ha ha, I hope Christ comes back through soon for the rapture, you know? Yeah, yeah because of what's happened. What, it, what, I mean, it's almost, it's almost depressing in reality. Yeah. But, you know, yes, we do have a great God who is orchestrating and moving and yeah. Caring for his people, but I think the one thing you, you, you have to know here is the history of, of how God has worked in similar situations in the past. I'd say that's the first thing that we, we just have to keep in, in uh, keep in, in contact with. That little group in Scrooby, England. My wife and I talk about them all the time. The original pilgrims, if you will, chased from pillar to post. You have the King of England. James saying, I'll hire them out of, the, out of the country or worse. He made it illegal for them to live there, and then he made it illegal for them to leave. He was just a, a, a bad person. Um, they were faithful to Christ. And look at, the, look at the results of their faithfulness. So I think one of the things we have to always remember is God, is not God has really not called me to save America, even Pennsylvania. He has called me to be faithful. This is what, something we must remember. And that faithfulness always starts very close to us. We, we must remember that. The second thing, and we, I actually talked about this while I was in South Africa, and I, I know I mentioned this from time to time, the Lot model versus the Abraham model. Lot had the influence, but he wasn't faithful. Abraham had the faithfulness, but he didn't have the influence. And yet he did have the influence in the end because he was faithful. It's hard to look at, but God has worked in the past in amazing ways in our own history. And that's, that is, I, I have to go back to faith in that God who has worked in the past. Because otherwise, I would, I would, I would lose my mind. That whole thing about Cosmore with that, with that orphanage, I, I just want to take a machine gun into Parliament and spray the area and go down like Samson. I'm, I'm not kidding. You, you wicked people, you. This is, this, is, this is my act of loving God and my neighbor right now. Yes? The other thing to remember is that over history, very few faithful men have seen the impact of their work. They have often done that work with blind faith, where they just roll up their sleeves and they persevere and they continue going and they don't often see how wide that influence spreads. I mean, you look back at like say Martin Luther, he saw the spread of what he did, but he did not see the whole extent of that spread. And he saw more than some faithful men have seen. So what duty is ours and results are God's, so we just do it knowing that you can't stop the move of the Holy Spirit. You've got to roll up your sleeves and persevere and be obedient, and then God will take it as far as he will take it. Yeah, here's, here's the challenge that we face there. It, 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 sounds, it sounds so parochial and limited to say, be faithful with your family, start there, right? But I would argue that the reason why we're in the mess that we're in is that we weren't faithful with our own family. We, we, we gave that up, and now that solution seems like impossible. Does that, does that, does that make sense? It seems so small. Yes. Well, a, amen to what Dave said. That's exactly what I was going to bring up is, you know, we, we, we have a tendency, and maybe it's just me, but we have a tendency to sit here and we listen to this and we go, those poor people, what an awful way to live. And all we are is a rich third world country as far as our morals and everything else goes because as Dave already said, we're exactly the same as them. 
And we have racism in the church that is rampant. I mean, there's a reason you have black churches and white churches, and, and whites won't minister with the blacks, and the blacks won't minister with the Hispanics, and Hispanics won't minister. I mean, this is, this is absolutely our reality as well. And we cannot sit here and go, well, oh my word, feel so bad for Africa. We need to, go, we need to go fix Africa, right? I mean, and I, I just had this conversation with somebody who was saying, well, you know, well, we recognize this racist problem. You know, we went and drilled a well in Africa. I said, that's great. How many African friends do you actually have stateside? They said, well, none. I said, well, then you're a hypocrite. You know, you can't just sit here and look at this and go, how do we fix Africa? The question is, how do we realize this is our reality? And how do we get mobilized to say, if God has worked over time and history in, in, in small ways, gradually, over time, then we do need to realize that exactly what you're saying, it's about generational faithfulness. My generation needs to be faithful for my generation. And I need to teach my children by my faithfulness that their generation is faithful. And, and we believe in that, that as time goes on, as each generation works in obedience, that we will eventually see the, the coming about of Christ's kingdom in greater and greater you know, ways. And I, I just think we can't, I hope we don't walk away from this going, poor Africa, how do we fix Africa? We need to walk away from this going, you know, the realities of this are that it's at our own doorstep and we must, as you're saying, we must start faithfully with our families and with our church right here. You know, that's, that's why I loved what happened here with Charles. Because Charles wasn't with this, with this head man. Because Charles wasn't being popular. You know, most missionaries, they say, well, I'll, they, put it, they put it on their, their, their rich friends, right? Their business friends. They'd say, well, I'll talk to people, you know, and I'll see, and then we'll just die or whatever. Or maybe bring the project back, and everybody feels good because we gave a bunch of money, and, and we don't follow up. You know, the, the, the wells run dry, or the maze machine break down, or whatever, but we're on to a new project. Uh, Peter Hammond told me about that happening in the Sudan, where these um, businessmen would w walk around with uh, people in, um, in, 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 they were all tied up, tied up, right? And these Americans would come over, right, and free the slaves, right? And then come back and tell them they freed all these slaves. And they just, these guys just walk around with these same amount of people, and these different Americans give them, keep giving them money to free the slaves. <laughs> And, 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 and that's, that was not happening here. It was, like the, it was like the real thing going on. Even though it's difficult, being faithful. That's, that's what I felt like I saw. I saw a missionary who was being faithful, but not being popular or being liked, quite frankly. It was wonderful to see. Yes. Last that, one, 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 well, it's time for one question. After it's gone. So. With all of that considered, how did this trip impact your view of missions trips in general? Okay. Good question. Um, this is how I see mission, mission trips a little bit different. I'll go on a missions trip if I can offer something that they don't have already. They already have people who can paint, dig holes, build outhouses. I did see that what I brought there, especially with my study on, I, I, they wanted me to do a presentation on an eschatology, which I did. Charles thought it was going to be like they were going to go crazy. Um, they just sat there and they listened. And Charles said later, said, your, your presentation was so um, right on and so biblically based that they couldn't, they, they couldn't say anything. He said, I wish my kids would have, would have been able to hear it. Um, and I was doing it through an interpreter. So I could see that I was bringing something there that they didn't have. So my view on missions trips is if, if you're bringing something that they don't have already, good. But if you're doing something that, 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 that they can do themselves, stay home. That makes sense. One more question if we have, we have time for. U.S. missions? Absolutely. Hur uh, hurricane relief, storm relief. Absolutely. Things like that? Absolutely. Sorry, you can ask one more question now. <laughs> sure does. Inc include your neighbor. Right next door. Yes. Last question. Did, 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 did Charles at all talk about the difference between like the rich and the poor, like other rich people, like in Cape Town, are they are they in cahoots with the government? Like, can you get rich on your own without the government? You know, is that opportunity there, or is it that bad that is the communism that bad that only the rich are? If, if you're uh, white, um, the only way you're going to make it is if you start your own business, because the. Um, uh, South Africa is the only country in the world that has affirmative action for the majority. 
And so it was very difficult to get a job as a white person in South Africa, even though you're a minority. So you got to start your own business. I talked to one businessman, P uh, Peter. His name was his wife was uh, Susanna, and uh, he told me he's been he's been he work he hires he hires blacks and wants to turn his business over to them, like tra train them. But he said it's very difficult to do that. But you can you can make it if you start your own business there, and you can still do it. Yes, Dan. Um, I guess I still don't quite understand the difference between the colors and the blacks. What is it? Just complexion? It, 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 it has facial features too that they recognize. While I was there, um, Charles said uh, said to uh, one of the guys there um, who was a guard, he said "Bonjour." I'm like, French? This is South Africa. Who speaks French? And uh, the guy the, the guy came back, "Come on, Talibu," or whatever they say, right? I don't know, probably not even saying it correctly. I said, "Charles, how do you?" What? He said, I could tell he's Congolese. And I knew, I knew we would know French. So the folks there can, there can tell. And it's very important to know these things. Kind of like our distinction between Mennonites and Amish, right? <laughs> Don't mix them up. OK. Well, thank you for your kind attention here. I'm available for more questions. Thank you for your support here at the Independence Reform Bible Church. It was a great trip. Um, Maybe do it again sometime, maybe get the time.